let's move on and talk about Swift Evolution. Now, Evolution, of course, is what's kind of powering the community changes behind Swift. Lots of big things have come through there since Swift 2, when uh, Evolution kicked off, I think. It's been huge, and it's still evolving, and it's sometimes hard to keep up with. How do you, as a prolific author of Swift, Swift UI, now functional programming, uh, speaker about Combine and more, how do you keep up with all the changes from Evolution? So when it used to be a news list, it was just a fire hose. Forums I'm finding harder because I, I miss conversations. So I missed a conversation that Doug Greger kicked off lately about um, what Function Builders is working on. So every couple of days I'll go to Evolution to see uh, what's new in proposals. Uh, what I find confusing is some will say, we're having the discussion from March 2nd to March 11th, and I'll say, but it's April 6th. What happened? <laughs> um, but for the most part, it's, it's been amazing. I'll often filter on what's in five point whatever, what's been uh, approved, and sometimes I find something that I've been waiting for actually finally got implemented. Uh, there's a lot in that accepted but not implemented, and they've gone through some of them and, and called them and say, yeah, we're not going to do that. But it would be nice if they would go through the older, accepted but not implemented, and decide, you know, some of these we're never going to do. And we're never going to do them, not because they were a bad idea, but because Swift isn't the same thing it was when this was a good idea. Right. I seem to recall only recently a... Okay, perhaps not recently, but I'll move on. Um, an evolution <laughs> proposal did go through. It was approved years ago and then finally got figured out. Uh, it, it might have happened twice. That's why I'm confused. I think it happened last year once uh, and someone figured out and he, he called it something like a, 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 a cheeky fix or something, a, a hacky fix. And it was a, a problem. It was it was uh, I, coming back to me now slowly. I think it was the use of self, the capital S, if I remember correctly. Anyway, they realized that they put it through and the compiler flag an error saying this doesn't work. And they basically intercepted that error message and put in the fix at that point at the diagnosis stage to make that work. And it basically solved a accepted idea from years earlier that they'd like to do, but it was just too hard to do. I think there was another one just recently. Uh, there was another one recently because I tweeted, hey, when did this go through? And someone told me. And it was either 5.1 or 5.2. It wasn't 5.2. Very few things went in in 5.2. And, and I just missed it. And it had been something that had been around for years. Mm. And when I read the discussion, it was they decided they were trying to do more than the proposal suggested and they could do what the proposal suggested and get it in. Yeah. But you're right, though. Swift isn't the same language when these things were accepted. But there isn't currently a process for unaccepting stuff. I mean, it happened with uh, Count Where, if you remember, Surish's... Um, Thing. It got confused with, I think, the count currying. Um, but it, it got approved, then implemented, then unimplemented, and then it's now back in approved state uh, and sort of loitering there. Right, but it hasn't been unapproved. Yeah, yeah, the idea is still good. We like the idea of this, this, this method. It's a great idea. It's a matter of can they get it into Swift in a way that does not detrimentally or significantly impact type inference, which is what it was doing. Yeah, I think, I think Ben Cohen or someone found an edge case where it, exactly. it was a real problem. Exactly. Yeah, and, and I could probably link uh, to Ben's uh, tweet because it was quite precise. But it was obviously mm -hmm. a problem for them, and they don't want to regress on the compiler performance at this point because it's already a, uh, a sore point sometimes, uh, and they don't want to go backwards, basically, which makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we went through this. So I was very involved in, in Java for a long time and um, actually was the editor of Java.net and wrote a bunch of books on it. And at one point we had to say, who are we writing books for? Because these are not people that were C programmers that are coming to Java. These are people who are either new to programming or, you know, something else. And it's the same thing with Swift. Our first books were often for objective C programmers coming to Swift. And now it's not. We, we have to think about a whole world of people coming to Swift. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what tips would you give to listeners who are struggling to stay on top of Swift's changes? They want to, they want to, you know, Keep using new great features from Swift. Make sure the code stays flexible and stays up to date and not crafty and old and similar. What tips would you have for listeners to say, do try these things, it'll help you stay on top of Swift evolution? 
So one is is just to, to promote what you do. You do something amazing. Every time Swift revs, you say, here's what's new in Swift. You have examples of how to use it. And you have a nice UI where they can say, well, I want just the changes between Swift 5.1 and 5.2. You can just, so you have a, a great uh, a resource for that and, and you keep it very up to date. I don't know how you ever sleep. So that's one thing. The other thing is try things out and see if you like them. For instance, something that's new is we don't have to use return statements in single expression functions. So we've had that in closures forever. It makes Swift UI read a lot nicer, mm -hmm. you know, although you have to sit and think a moment the first time you see Swift UI like, oh, it is returning something. Yep. Uh, other languages, anytime you have a function, the last line is what's returned. In Swift, it's only if it's a single expression. Uh, I think in the evolution proposal, they said that's just beyond what we are doing right now. Uh, but for consistency, that would be nice because it's odd that some places you use return, some places you don't. So what I'm saying is take a look at what you say is new and then try it out for yourself. You might like it. You might not like it. Um, you know, now that I'm not using return, I don't miss it the same way I don't miss semicolons. Right. And that's one of the interesting things I think about evolution is that we can look at it and say, they want this, this thing changed, but it, it's always been like that. that. That feels wrong. It feels alien. Um, and one of them that did not get through was um, eliding commas at the end of uh, lines for arrays. You could have A, new line, B, new line, C, and have those things be the same as a comma. And it got a lot of pushback. And for me, it's like, wow, that is alien. Of course it's alien. Because it's new. It's not what we're used to. But then a week, two weeks, three weeks of using it, and it stops being alien. It starts being natural. And you look back and think, well, hasn't it always been that way? And it, of course it hasn't mm -hmm. been. And then there was a sort of the other side of that. Someone proposed in functions that the argument list, the last argument could have a comma after it because it made it easier for you to add additional arguments and remove things and not, there were no errors. And that didn't go through. And the, the first community proposal that went through, the first thing proposed by someone outside of Apple, was getting rid of the plus plus and the minus minus. Erica's reign of terror she had on Swift 3. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that just looks so funny to us because we've used it for years. But mm. now we don't. Yeah, now we really don't. And it's interesting that, I mean, there's a, there's a point somewhere. Obviously, we've passed Swift 3 now, so they don't want to break too much. But things we just take for granted the plus plus being one of them, minus minus being another one, exclamation marks to mean not. We just take that for granted. That's how it was in C or Objective-C. That's how it should be elsewhere. But it's not in any way natural. None of this stuff is natural. We've been taught that this thing means not. And it's interesting that in my own code, and I see a lot of other developers do the same thing, I would much rather write uh, if is logged in equals equals false than say if not or if exclamation mark is logged in because it might I can read one naturally like English and the other one I can't necessarily read like English. Yeah, and, and just to go full circle back, a lot of people's objection as they come to functional programming is it's not natural, which just means I'm not used to it. You know, uh, who who is the guy that wrote the humane interface? Uh, the guy that was on the Mac project for Apple, Jeff Raskin. And, and he says, there isn't such a thing as, as an intuitive interface. It's the interface you're used to. And so it's the same with the language. And, and you know, functional is going to feel different. It's going to feel horrible. Why? Oh, this is just stupid. Yeah. And then you get used to it. And as you say, you don't even notice what bothered you yesterday. Yeah, it's true. You're breaking the muscle memory and making new muscle memory, you know, literally carving out new neurons in your brain, or at least retraining them to uh, do different kinds of things.